Brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, welcome to chapter number nine for our weekly uh, session with uh, Dr. Punya Wong on his book, Breaking Myths. So a uh, short introduction for Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong graduated from the University of Malaya and joined Monash University Malaysia in 2007 as Associate Professor in Internal Medicine to form the pioneer faculty of the clinical school in Johor Bahru. He has been based in Johor Bahru since 1990 and has been sharing the Dhamma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta for the past two decades and was also invited speaker at the third, seventh and eighth global conferences on Buddhism. Dr. Wong recently launched his second Dhamma book entitled Breaking Myths and is now sharing chapters from his book weekly on Friday nights. This talk is being broadcasted to 12 Buddhist organizations. For tonight, the title is, Are You Religious? Are you religious? Uh, over to you, Dr. Punyao. Good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Namo Buddhaya, and we at Johor Bahru, who are relatively safe, wishes all of you in the Klang Valley, in Selangor, the very, very best. Keep warm, keep safe, it's raining every day, and stay away from crowds. Now, tonight, our sharing is on whether you are religious, and I would like us to be clear as to what religion means, what does being religious mean, and this is of course versus spirituality. Now, many people are outwardly very religious with regimented practices, rites and rituals performed religiously. In public, temples, centers, one prostrates, pray, chant, all behavior that shows one's purported righteousness and piousness. I am very sure every one of us is familiar with um, people within the Dhamma family or outside the Dhamma family who are like this. And the person might consciously or unconsciously be very well behaved in public, and some of them are very good people. But for some, their personal thoughts and emotions may well differ from the public image that is shown. And greed in various forms, anger, intolerance, conceit, pride, harsh speech, and views and attachments literally set in stone may still be prevalent. What do I mean? Now, many people dress for their religion, argue for their religion, spread their religion, eat for their religion, following very strict diets. They will even fight for their religion and even perhaps go to the extent of killing for their religion. All you need to do is to open the newspapers, take a look, and you will know exactly what I mean. Or if you don't read newspapers anymore like I do, just look at the internet news. And you will also know what I mean. And very sadly, even within so-called Buddhist countries, we are now beginning to see such things. Now, all these people hardly do what their religion's founders actually teach them to do. And that is to live in peace, to love their neighbor, to be kind, to forgive, to be humble and simple. Now, within the Buddha Dharma, simply religiously following rites and rituals is actually seen as improper and classified as attachments to rites and rituals. In Pali, Sila Bata Paramasa. Modern contemporary English, holier than thou, but without 
the understanding nor the transformation of mind. Without the inner transformation of mind, a religious person can be quite a dangerous person. He can be, in fact, very impulsive, my way or the highway. He can be very violent, either in words or in action. He can be very fanatical. And of course, in some situations, sadly, even kill. Sila, of course, is a word familiar to all of us, and it refers to moral conduct. Wata or bata to religious duty, observance, rites, practice, customs, paramasa to being attached to. So put together, sila bata paramasa can be seen as the contagion of mere rules and rituals, infatuations of public good works, or the delusion that these alone suffice, or simply put, falling back to attachments to precepts and rules. Now I bring you back to the Buddha. If we all have a time machine, and we all go back 2,600 years ago, and we be a silent observer on the sidelines looking at the Buddha, and you would have seen that the Buddha was quite a revisionist of his times. He would have been considered a rebel today. For he spoke out against much beloved mainline accepted rites like sacrificial offerings, prayers, rituals, etc. This was a man who spoke out against what mainstream beliefs are. Even if you try to do that today, you will get into big trouble. The least being, you'll be excommunicated from your center. The worst being, something horrible happens to you. Being religious requires you to pretend a lot. You have to be very religious, as the word goes, which means you have to appear so. You're going to do a lot of rites and rituals, a lot of outward manifestation of your holiness. But being spiritual can be quite a different thing. It is really a manifestation of who you truly are. Now, the truth of the Dhamma can only be grasped through insight, never through blind faith, or through fear of some known or unknown being. And not only did the Buddha discourage blind faith and fear of an omnipotent divine being, as unsuitable approaches for understanding the truth. He also, very briefly, denounced adherence to unprofitable rites and rituals because outward gestures such as chanting, bathing in rivers, animal sacrifice, etc., does not purify a man or make a person noble. I have often quoted these two verses from the Dhammapada. And occasionally it has got me into trouble. Occasionally it has made people upset. Well, for anyone who gets upset by me, I offer my sincere apologies. But I'm merely re restating what is said by the Buddha as recorded in the Dhammapada. And I read it for you here. Even though reciting abundant scriptures, the heedless one who does not what they say, like a cowboy counting other kettles, does not partake of the ascetic life or the holy life. Even though reciting only few scriptures, but living in accordance with Dhamma, abandoning greed, hate and delusion, understanding all right with mind release, that one, unattached here and hereafter, surely partakes of the ascetic life. What the Buddha is teaching us is that the mere recitation or chanting without inner transformation in our thoughts, speech and behavior is just like you counting your neighbor's cattle there is no improvement 
there is no holy life. But even though if you recite just a few scriptures, but you live in accordance with the Dhamma, you progressively lessen greed, hate, delusion. You understand, your mind is released. You are unfettered from all the attachments. Then you surely partake of the holy life. And understandably, this that I quote has got some people upset. And as I said, if I made you upset, I offer my sincere apologies. But I'm merely repeating what is taught in the Dhammapada. Now, this is taken from the suttas. And it really showed how the Buddha went against mainline thinking. I am very sure that had the Buddha been alive today, had done a similar thing in the India of today, probably some violent act or some violent deed will be done by someone on the body of the Buddha. Once the Buddha explained how a seeker of deliverance should train himself and added that the person whose mind is free from taints, the defilements, whose life of purity is perfected and the task done could be called one who bathes inwardly, not externally, but inwardly. Then the Brahmin Sundarika Barawaja asked him, does the venerable Gautama go to bathe in the river Bahuka? The river Bahuka being one of the holy rivers which the pious go to bathe in the belief that it will wash away their sins. And the Buddha replied, Brahmin, what good is the river Bahuka? What can the river Bahuka do? And the Brahmin replied, indeed, Venerable Gautama, the river Bahuka is believed by many to be holy. Many people have their evil deeds washed away in the river Bahuka. Well, today we have similar acts. Today we have Buddhists piously going, asking for venerables to bless them with water, etc., etc. We still have the same mindset. We have instant noodle, instant coffee. We similarly want instant deliverance. Then the Buddha made him, the Brahmin, understand that bathing in rivers would not cleanse a man of his dirt of evil and instructed him thus, bathe just here in this doctrine and discipline, the Dhamma Vinaya Brahmin. Give security to all beings. Do not harm, do not sacrifice, do not kill other beings in your pursuit. If you do not speak falsehood or kill or steal, if you are confident and are not mean, you are a generous man. What does it avail you to go to Gaya, the name of the river in India? Your well at home is also a Gaya. Now, please note, this is going against mainstream beliefs. If you go to any country today and you make a statement like that against the mainstream beliefs of the people, you are literally challenging the beliefs of the people. And you can get into big trouble. So if one understands this context, you would understand the Buddha was one who was very against meaningless, useless rites and rituals. He instead wants you to purify your mind, not bathe your body. Let us take a look from the Arahan Punika as recorded in the Terigata. Along the same line, the Arahan Punika told this man, who taught you this? The ignorant to the ignorant. My goodness, if I made a statement like that, I'll probably be excommunicated from the center immediately. But she said this clearly, who taught you this? The ignorant to the ignorant, the fool to the fool. One through water evolution, evolution means holy bathing, is from evil karma set free. In that case, they'll all go to heaven. All the frogs, turtles, serpents, crocodiles, 
and anything else that lives in the water. Sheep butchers, pork butchers, fishermen, trappers, thieves, executioners, and any other evildoers would, through water evolution, be free from this evil karma. Just use your common sense. If this river could carry off the evil karma you have done in the past, they will jolly well carry off your merit as well, and you will be completely left out. Whatever it is that you fear, that you're going down to this river, don't do it. Don't let the cold hurt your skin. Again, this is a very brave bikuni. She is no doubt stating the absolute truth. But even if we are to repeat this same truth today, in BGF, you will, I assure you, get into trouble. So, put it modern way, a person witnesses a wise person doing puja, paying homage, reciting the vadana, making offerings of fruits, light, etc. But without understanding the reasons for these, that person, person mimics such behavior and clings to it, thinking that is the way. And even though he has the external behavior that resembles the wise, his mind is unfortunately still clouded by ignorance. Instead of striving to learn the Dhamma, he becomes content with the external ritualistic forms. So sila bata paramasa, or attachments to rites and rituals, does not give rise to release. And I have to admit, even within my own extended family, my late mother, for example, was very pious, very religiously pious. And she followed all these offerings, puja, strictly. But unfortunately, she did not pay much attention to learning the Dhamma. Being of her generation, all they wanted was, when I go through this puja, when I go through this process, this ritual, may my family be well. That's all. It ended there. And so while I always confess that I probably benefited from much of the metta that she had shown through her devotion to the puja, the unfortunate thing was she did not go beyond this to improve her understanding of the Dhamma. And if we think of our older generations, especially the generation that came from China, for example, many of them were very religious, very pious, but they did not go beyond. Of course, many do, but many also did not. Now, pujas are important educational tools that teaches us humility when we bow to someone whom we respect. It teaches us to respect those worthy of respect. It honors the Buddha and it recalls the qualities of the triple gems. Now, offerings are symbolic lessons of the Dhamma. Hence, it is crucial that we know its significance. Puja, of course, also provides communal activities and builds fellowship among fellow Dhamma fairers importantly, building the bonds of Kayana meters. So it is understanding of the puja, understanding of the chants, understanding why we make these offerings, that is very crucial. Otherwise, it becomes a mere ritual. Pujas, as I said, can be communal, which is good for building collective activity, friendship, collective activities, and of course, Kayana meters. Or pujas can be individual, like my wife here, shown doing her morning puja. Both are equally important. When we do a puja, often people mistaken it as prayers. 
It is not. A puja is to honor someone. And if you look at the word worship, in the Buddhist context, it does not mean praying to someone. We call in old English judges your worship. Somebody very respected your worship. And here, that expression is a better reflection of what in the Buddha, Buddha Dharma is puja. And we venerate with deep respect the Buddha. And to venerate someone is to regard with great respect. Hence, you have, oh, the venerable Sangha, oh, venerable teacher, venerable sirs. Or we had a very respected professor, we say the venerable professor, someone we regard with deep respect. And worship varies between cultures, and it could be just silent meditation or chanting or sermons, sharing the Dhamma. Worship, as I said, is an expression of reverence used in addressing or referring to someone important whom we regard with deep respect. So when it is conducted mindfully, for example, before the sharing of the Dhamma, it brings us into a calmer state of mind. If you do it in the mornings before you begin, it is a way of calming your mind with the Dhamma before we go on to face the activities of life which goes up and down. And of course, it will be good if we can bracket our days beginning with puja and ending with puja. Bracket it with these two activities so that we start the day on the right tone with the Dhamma in mind and we end the day similarly. When I was in secondary school, I had very good teachers very good people who tried to make us good people. And one of the things they taught us was that God is a jealous God. You must not worship any other God besides the Lord thy God, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God. Now, even as a young teenager at that time, I felt, hey, something is not right. Why should an all-powerful, omnipotent being be jealous. That doesn't sound right. That's a contradiction in terms. Jealous of what? Now the Buddha is a fully enlightened one. He does not need to be praised nor bribed with offerings. He does not get jealous if, he, if you were to know. Conceit, pride, restlessness are all the fetters that an arahan would have overcome. So a Buddha does not get jealous, neither does he demand homage or loyalty. Such things don't even exist in the mind of a fully enlightened being. So the entire exercise of the puja is for us, not for the Buddha, not for the Dhamma, not for the Sangha, but for us to cultivate and learn I insist whenever I take my medical students on any form of Buddhist activities that they must understand whatever that we are doing. They are taught to challenge, ask, question everything. When you offer light, when you offer a candle, or in modern days now, an electric light, that offering of light symbolizes the wisdom of the Dhamma. That Dhamma is the light, the GPS that will guide us in our daily lives. And it clears away the darkness of ignorance. So when you offer light on the altar of your home or your center, keep in mind, may this offering of light symbolizing the wisdom of the Dhamma guide me in my daily life, clearing away the darkness of my ignorance. You are actually offering that light for yourself. When you offer incense, 
the offering of incense symbolizes the fragrance of pure moral conduct. This is again a line taken from the Dhammapada, where the Buddha said, if you have good sila, you don't need to go around publicizing it, telling everyone, I keep my precepts, I keep my precepts, I don't know about you, but I keep my precepts. You do not need to even do that because like the fragrance of incense, people around you will know. So when you offer incense, it's a reminder for you, for me, to cultivate good behavior. We offer water. No matter how you stir water, leave it alone in a very short while, it comes down. It symbolizes purity, clarity, and calmness. It reminds us that the Buddha's teachings can help us cleanse our mind of desires, ill will, and delusion, attain calmness, stillness, and purity. And the offering of fruits teaches a very important Dhamma lesson. Within the fruit is a seed. And from that seed will arise another fruit. It is a lesson of cause and effect that all seeds of our actions will have their fruits of effects. You cannot plant a bitter gout and expect a durian. You cannot plant a rambutan and expect a mango. It's a very important lesson every time we offer fruits, reminding us of a fundamental core teaching of the Buddha Dharma, cause and effect. So note that all these are not for the Buddha. They are for our education. Flowers, we love to offer beautiful flowers. And it's a lesson in impermanence for the most beautiful flower with the freshest fragrance. Within a few days, it will wither. It reminds us to live every moment well, truly, fully performing our very best. For life is uncertain. It is very important for us as students of the Buddha Dharma to know that Pujja, pronounced as P-O-O-J-A, Pujja is not a direct telephone line telling the Buddha what to do. Very often we fall into this trap and we become a consultant to the Buddha, telling the Buddha what to do. That is not at all within the Buddha's teachings. Instead, we should, with the wisdom of the Dhamma, ask of ourselves, what would the Buddha do in such a situation? In other words, Dhamma is your ultimate refuge. Even the Buddha became the Buddha because of the Dhamma. Now, petitioner prayers demanding that the laws of nature be changed for our sake is not only not logical, nor is it part of the Buddhist teachings. Now, you will by now realize that this is very much against the tune of many, many theistic religions. And I like the answer Ajahn Brahm gave when he was asked if Buddhism was a religion, he replied without any hesitation, it is, but only for tax purposes. I cannot think of a better answer than this. Now nature is impartial. Like it or not, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, it is not flattered by prayer. Instead, the Buddha has taught us this. If it is something that you can do, wholesome, good, praised by the wise, 
for the benefit of you and others. For heaven's sake, please act. This is mastery of the situation. But if it is something which you can't control, then there are many things in life which we can't control. It's anatta, it's anicca, it is unstable, unreliable. There are many things in life which we can't control. Aging, for example, can't be controlled. The fact that we will all fall sick one day can't be controlled. No matter what you do, you are going to fall sick, you're going to age. So let us accept it with grace. Ceaselessly striving to stop that would be an exercise in futility. Instead, we are taught to accept it, let go. So this and this is very important. If there is something that we can do and we don't do it, then you're very silly. If similarly, something that you can't do anything, for example, aging, and you insist on taking tons of supplements which are a complete waste of money, that is just ceaseless striving, knocking your head against the wall. Puja is for us to honor, to revise the lessons of the Dhamma, to express gratitude, and now to make noble aspirations. And this is where I will need to explain a little bit. What do we mean when we say making noble aspirations? Making noble aspirations in front of the Buddha Rupam or after doing a good deed or after doing some dana or some wholesome act, we make a promise to ourselves to do good, selfless, wholesome intentions. And this is just an example. As a Buddhist, I go to the Buddha for guidance. I go to the Dhamma for guidance. I go to the Sangha for guidance. May all beings be happy and well, joyous. We are taught to use this line. May they live without fear, understanding interdependence and compassion. I know that what I do now affects my happiness or unhappiness and also that of others. May all existence, human and others, whether weak or strong, small or great, near or far and throughout time, may they attain perfect peace, enlightenment. May they be happy, may they be well. Now, I once took a group of my students to a monastery to offer lunch dana. At the end, yes, it was reflection. The Bhantes was giving blessing. And I told my students, make a noble aspiration. That does not mean, may I have a good boyfriend or girlfriend? Oh, may I pass my exam with distinction? No, that's not a good noble aspiration. That's a very individual selfish thing to ask. Instead, make a good noble aspiration. May I be a good person? May I be a good doctor? May I help people who are unwell, etc., etc. Ajahn Jayasaro explained what is chanda, the right motivation. And here the Buddha spoke of two kinds of desire. One, desire which arises from ignorance and delusion, which is called tanha, craving. So at the end, if you have done something noble, wholesome, and you say, oh, may I be rich? Or may I strike the lottery, etc." That is not a very noble aspiration. In contrast to a desire that arises from wisdom and intelligence, which is kusala chanda or dhamma chanda, or most simply just called chanda. A wholesome, selfless, aspiration to do good, to be good. Often we say, by these merits, may I have the teachers to guide us to learn the Dhamma so that we can be freed from our defilements and attain the peace of Nibbana. 
or something simple. By these merits, may all be happy and well. May my parents be happy and well. May my family be happy and well, etc., etc. Most of which are familiar to the people listening in now. Now, during the puja, we remind ourselves of the five precepts often, making a sincere pledge to keep them. And here again, I repeat from what I've said in previous sharings, the five precepts are completely secular. There's absolutely nothing religious in the five precepts at all. They are completely human values. So many people have very good behavior while they are in the center. And I quote a line from the first Chan master Bodhidharma, what you call a monastery, he said, we call a Sangharama, a place of purity. But whoever denies entry, that means any one of you now at your home listening, any one of you who denies entry into your mind of the three poisons, greed, hatred, delusion, and keep the gates of your senses pure, your six senses, your five senses and your mind, your body and mind still calm, inside and outside clean. You built a monastery. That monastery is you. Now, this little picture of a little boy passing urine teaches a very important Chan lesson. It's Sister Li Ming's birthday today. I wish her blessed birthday. Be well, be happy, be safe. Now on top, Sister Li Ming of the rhinoceros that you are supposed to get, you will now have to get this little boy passing urine too and place it on your table in your office because these teachers a very important Chan lesson. There was this little novice monk, like this cute little boy in this figurine. And he was sitting in a long drawn chanting session in the main hall of the monastery. And he went on and on and on. Now, somewhere along the way, he needed to pee. So he stood up, walked through the front gate, the front door, at the foot of a tree, he peed and then rushed back inside the hall, continued sitting, doing whatever he was supposed to do. At the end of that chanting session, the abbot who saw it all asked for him. So the poor little boy was hauled to the front and the abbot asked him in no uncertain terms, how can you be so rude to pass urine in front of the Buddha. There's a big Buddha image, obviously, in the main shrine hall. The little boy looked up at the abbot and he asked the abbot in return, Venerable abbot, he said, can you please tell me where I can pass urine that is not in front of the Buddha? At which point, the venerable abbot learned a very important lesson. So Sister Li Ming, one more item for you to buy. Very important lesson. Now rites and rituals is an inalienable part of all religions, but within the Buddha Dharma, it is only one aspect of communal activities and a mechanism for those who needs its psychological support. Yes, many people need the psychological comfort of doing something like chanting, offering, etc. But when the physical act becomes more important than the education it is meant to transmit, it becomes a blind devotional rite, and such is seen as a fetter. A fetter is a chain or a bond which shackles a sentient being to samsara. And I think most of you here will be familiar that there are 10 fetters 
that we need to be freed from to attain awakening. I've listed the 10 here. If one breaks through the first three, believe in a self, doubt or uncertainty, attachment to rites and rituals, one becomes a sotapan, a stream enterer. A sakanda gami in the next level will have weakened number four and number five. He would have broken the first three and weakened number four and number five. And he is what is called a once return. He will return to be reborn as a human being one more time. While the anagamin will have broken the first five, all the first five have been broken and he is a non-returner. While for the arahan, he would break on top of the first five, the next five. And this of course includes conceit, restlessness and ignorance. Now, the attachments to rites and rituals is such an important factor that it is also listed in the Upadanas. If you are familiar with dependent origination, you will know that the link that provides the cause for becoming or rebirth, for lack of a better word, is the Upadanas. And there are four Upadanas. These four Upadanas, literally, the word Upadana means few. These four is the few. The Minya, the Ron 95, that leads to your future becoming or rebirth. And these are the four clingings, the four Upadanas that we must progressively let go of. These are the four which makes us re-become another being or reborn for lack of a better word. And one is of course, from the word Kama, Kama Upadana. We are so attached to our sense pleasures. Another one is from wheels, Ditti, Ditti Upadana. And people, brothers and sisters are very strongly attached to views. People are so strongly attached to views that they will kill you if you challenge their views or so-called insult their views. Or even in the lower end, if you go against my view, it's my way or the highway, please leave. So ditti upadana or attachment to views is actually very, very strong. The next is rites and rituals, which we have already discussed. And of course, one of the strongest upadanas is the attachment to the self. Most people, other than the Arahan, other than the Ananagamin, Anagamin, even at the moment of death, they are still so attached to the self. And this is what makes us reborn or become again. So brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, if rites and rituals is not enough, then what is enough? That would be a very important question, isn't it? So if Dr. Wong says that rites and rituals is not enough, then pray tell Dr. Wong, what is enough then? What is enough is when all that we do, thought, speech and action is guided by right views, wholesome and accomplished with mindfulness, not only as a passing phase during meditation or in a center or in front of a Buddha image, but within life on a moment to moment basis calmly. Merely following rites, teachings and even meditation is not enough. It is not the clothes that we wear or the ceremonies we perform or even the meditation that you do. Devadatta was a superb meditator and look what came out of him. It is surely not what we eat or drink. Hitler was a vegetarian, a strict vegetarian. All these are merely the means to an end. 
it is whether we finally genuinely see and agree with the four fundamental discoveries the Buddha made under the Bodhi tree, that is the four noble truths, the eightfold noble path, and the three universal characteristics of anicca, impermanence, dukkha, dissatisfaction or stress, and anatta, not self. If and when you do see the four noble truths, agree with the four noble truths, understand the noble eightfold path, and the three universal characteristics, then you are truly the disciples of the Buddha. Now the religious person accepts dogma and commandments, rites and rituals in good faith, while spirituality is for those who want the freedom to think and be awake. And the pedagogy of the Buddha Dharma involves much self-reflection and search. Its outcome is awakening. You must be a free thinker, freed from the bonds that tie you from thinking. You must search, ask, think, look for yourself, within yourself, but out in your surroundings, the truths of life, and not simply go through the motions of rites and rituals. Clinging on superstitiously to any kind of rituals is not the way. Instead, we should be using rites and rituals as a stepping stone to progress on the path. And I quote from the Sutta Nipata, the Buddha said, I do not say one attains purification by view, tradition, knowledge, virtual or ritual nor is it attained without will, tradition, knowledge, virtue, or ritual. Now, all these are the means. It is only by taking these above as the means and not grasping them as ends in themselves that one consequently does not crave for re-becoming or rebirth. An important point. We are all familiar with the Noble Eightfold Path. Any Dhamma class would have gone through this Noble Eightfold Path. Anyone? Now, I want to ask you, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, the Buddha had taught us this is the way to awakening to enlightenment. Do you see rites and rituals here? Is it in any of the eight factors? It is not. There is no mention of rites and rituals in the Noble Eightfold Path, the way to liberation. Rites and rituals is important, as I said, but it is a means, not the end. And while religions have many dogmatic teachings which cannot be challenged, the Buddha instead taught us to challenge and question everything. Is it skillful, he asked? Is it blameless? Is it wise? Does it lead to welfare and happiness? Note the inclusiveness of the teaching. So even if you are to ask me, is that teacher correct? Is this teacher correct? Is that teaching correct? I will say, read this. The words of the Buddha. When you follow it, is it skillful? Is it blameless? Is it wise? Does it lead to welfare and happiness? And this exactly, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, was what was asked of the Buddha when he passed the little town occupied by the Kalamas. Apparently, the town is at the crossroads where many, many different teachers Pass through. And each of them would, of course, taught their teaching, their Dhamma. And of course, many would have claimed that only they are right and all else is wrong. And so when the Kalamas heard that the Buddha, this teacher, was passing through, and he had a very good reputation as a good, rational, logical teacher, 
the Kalamas asked the Buddha as he passed through. Is he right? Is you, are you right? Is that wrong? Is this right? Is that wrong? Is that book correct? Is this book wrong? Etc. Etc. And the Buddha's answer is a wonderful answer. He said, do not go by reports, legends, traditions, scripture, logical conjecture, inference, analogy, etc., etc., or my teacher, your teacher. But know for yourself, these qualities are skillful. These qualities are blameless, praised by the wise, when adopted and carried out, leads to welfare and happiness. Then you should enter and remain in them. I think that this last line in this paragraph is very important. For I had been to many centers in which they had posters put up and he says, don't go by this, don't go by this, don't go by this, don't go by this. But they omitted the last line in this paragraph because certainly the Buddha did not condemn any of those teachers. Neither did he say, only follow me for only I am right. Neither did he say, that is rubbish, this scripture is rubbish, that teacher is talking rubbish. He didn't say anything like that. He said, use your logic, questioning, mind, and ask yourself, if you carry this according to this, is it skillful? Is it blameless? Is it praised by the wise? And, varied, and when adopted and carried out, leads to welfare and happiness. If so, then you should enter and remain in them. So I don't care what yana you're talking about. I don't care what school you're talking about, which lineage you're talking about. I will repeat this beautiful lesson as taught by the Buddha. Ask yourself these questions and note the Buddha was very, very inclusive. When one knows that one's actions are wholesome, skillful, blameless, wise, leading to welfare and happiness, then you gain inner peace. And the Buddha wants you to evolve spiritually to the highest possible state. He doesn't want you to end up as a person so narrow-minded with eyes blinkered that you can only see what your views are. He wants you to think like a Buddha. So while organized religions is the cause of much divisions, wars and bloodshed in history, think of the Crusades, think of the Spanish Inquisition, think of South America, or the horrors that went through, present day, think of what's happening in the Middle East. All those are tragic, to put it mildly. The Buddha Dharma requires no conversion, no defending, no sacrifice only an honest look at life. For when you look for yourself and you know, there is nothing to believe. Spirituality is defined as the feelings, thoughts, experiences that arise in the search for the sacred. It is an attempt in identifying, articulating, maintaining, transforming, understanding, knowing and embodying what is the divine higher power, the ultimate reality? That is what we are searching for. And organized religions follow the concepts of a book or books, but the Buddha Dharma looks at our own mind and our immediate surroundings to see the empirical truth. And many organized religions fill it believers with dreams of glory in a future heaven or paradise. The Buddha wants you to awake to that glory that is living every moment mindfully now. So if you ever stopped at a bus stop by a nice young teenage white boy wearing a tie, asking you, brother, do you want eternal life? 
you can well reply him that I have no need to search for an eternal life because I am already in an eternal life now. Now, a religious person will do what he is told, no matter what is right. And I do not need to give examples of this. Any one of you who had attended religious classes will know. Whereas a spiritual person will do what is right, no matter what he is told. Now, in medicine, this is called the father's versus the mother's principle. One of my fellow lecturers at my university, Dr. Ho Lun Shin, whom I seen as spiritual but not religious, he taught in a seminal lecture the difference between what is the father's principle and the mother's principle. And this was a lecture on medicine, ethics in medicine. The father's principle is that the father may sacrifice his own child to fulfill a principle. But the mother may sacrifice any principle to preserve her child. Now the father's principle is to me taught in many organized religions. Very dogmatic, an eye for an eye, sacrificial, tribal. The mother's principle uses rationality and logic and utilizes the questioning intellectual mind to decide on outcome. So are you religious or are you spiritual? Very frankly, brothers and sisters, I'm quite allergic to rites and rituals. And this had sadly earned me the wrath of many people. So religion is belief in someone else's experience or spirituality is having your own experience. Religion tells you what is supposed to be the truth. Spirituality lets you discover it for yourself. So here I put a table comparing the two. Religion is found in centers. Spirituality is found within yourself. And while there are many, many religions, there is only one spirituality. It is within you, found within you. It encourages you to question, to reason, to argue, to investigate. It allows you to be brave. It makes you search for inner peace. It actually encourages discovery. While many religions would consider that as an absolute no-no to question dogma. Spirituality is universal. It lets you discover it yourself in yourself within independently, and it allows you to discover the truth. It doesn't offer you what is within them as the truth, but lets you discover it yourself as the truth. Brothers and sisters, this is my last slide. And again, a Chan lesson. No sister Li Ming, you don't have to buy a lantern, but this Chan lesson involves a lantern. Late one night, a blind man visiting a friend was going to go home. Please, he said to his friend, may I take your lantern with me? And the friend said, why carry a lantern? You won't see any better with it after all you are blind. No, said the blind one, perhaps not, but others will see me better and not bumped into me. Yeah, that's logical. So the friend gave the blind man a lantern, you know, the classic paper lantern, like the one you play at Mid-Autumn Festival with a candle inside. And off went the blind man with the lantern. And before he had walked long, someone smashed right into him not right into him. And the blind man was very angry and he said, why don't you look up? He stormed. Why don't you see this lantern? And the man said, why don't you light the candle? Asked the traveler. That means the lantern, the candle inside had already blown out. Now Sister Li Ming, Barbara Bobby will have to meditate on this for three years and then come back and tell me what's the answer. But we don't have that luxury, so I'll have to tell the answer immediately. 
we are all holding lanterns. Every one of us, me included. Rituals are part and parcel of Buddhist culture. Are these rituals still relevant? Or is it just like that blind man carrying a lantern? The man held that lamp in his hands, that lantern, for the light it was meant to give. He thought that the candle inside the lantern was lit. But that candle had already gone off. So holding the lantern high and walking after the flame had died out, it's just a meaningless ritual. It does not shed any light at all. And many rites that started with a purpose had already have that candle blown out. They have lost their original quality. But we are still holding it like the blind man holding that lantern, still continuing walking with it, a meaningless ritual. Are you holding a lantern? If you are, make sure it is lit and that the candlelight is still burning. How meaningful are the rituals that you are doing now to you and your family? It is high time we understand its purpose and make it into bright lamps to guide us in our lives. And let me ask you, I'm sure you, me, when we were small, we were all taught by our parents, like offer three joysticks. Now I ask you very honestly, why three joysticks? Why not five? Better ma, more incense. Why not nine? All right? Why three? We have long forgotten the candle that was burning inside. That candle had long blown off. We offer three to honor the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. We offer three to make that chanda, that noble aspiration to do all good, avoid all evil, and cultivate the mind. If we had long forgotten this, if that candlelight inside the lantern had all the time been blown off without us realizing, and we are just mindlessly offering three joysticks, you better create a new tool now, maybe a PowerPoint, because otherwise we are like the blind man holding a lantern with no candle inside. Brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share. Thank you. I would like to share tonight's merits with a sister, Sister New who just had an operation. May she recover quickly. May she have comfort. May she have good rest. And may she have peace, happiness, good sleep in this period of recovery. May all Dharma brothers and sisters in Slango, in Negri Sembilan, that I believe are facing high numbers of COVID-19 patients, may you all be safe May you all stay safe, stay home, and avoid touching men, mouth, eyes, nose. Avoid touching men at all costs. Avoid touching your mouth, your eyes, your nose. With that, thank you and sadhu. Thank you, Dr. Punya Wang, for the uh, very <clears throat> eye-opening talk. Very. Uh, the moment there are five questions, for those listening, kindly keep your questions coming in. You, you may write in your Facebook chat and someone will copy and paste into a chat group here. So, uh, first question from Brother Whaley. Is it considered religious if one attending a Sangha member's talk just to get blessings sprinkled for better luck at the end of the talk? Sprinkle water. Frankly, I think you take a shower in your room with a nice Panasonic hot water will probably do the same good. However, as I say this, I am always mindful that there are members who want such psychological support. They want such comfort. And so people seek it 
and the Sangha offer it. But if you are someone who is aware and who knows, you will understand better. Okay? So, yes, I know this is a very common practice, very, very common practice for people to ask for this, ask for a yellow band, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, it provides psychological comfort, but I don't think it will do much beyond that. You're not gonna change the laws of nature just by having water sprinkled on you, okay? Okay, second question from uh, David T. If a person, despite being religious, but without having the right understanding of reality of life and mental purification, according to the Dharma, how far can he go towards finding liberation from samsara? Well, he might still be a very good man, as I said, as I mentioned right at the start of the talk, I have very good friends. I, have, I know very good people who are religiously following rites and rituals of whatever faith, and they are good people. So they may not have the wisdom of the Dhamma, but they certainly are good people following Sila and doing Dana. So if you were talking about awakening, then it is not. But there are a lot of people who are not interested in awakening. They are what we call karmatic Buddhists. What they want is they want a reasonably good life. They want probably a better uh, state when they are reborn in the future. And so they keep their sila, they do their dana, and they follow religious rites, but they do not sadly are interested in learning more about the Dhamma. So they will have the fruits of the seeds that are planted, which are good seeds, because these are moral people with lots of good meritorious acts. So they will come back, they will have the good effects of the seeds that they planted. But if you're asking about awakening or enlightenment, then they are not going to go beyond that. Because remember, even a stream enterer has the three qualities that I mentioned earlier. No doubt, already a fundamental understanding that this body is not the self. And of course, they are already aware that rites and rituals is not the way. So these are good people whom we call karmatic Buddhists. They are good people who have good results of their action, but these would still be what in Chinese we call folk bow. All right? Not gong tak, but folk bow. That means they will have fruits of the seeds that are planted that will result in good life, prosperity, etc., but not awakening. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wong. The next two questions are from Dima Piao. First question, Professor, in your opinion, what constitutes the spirituality aspect of Buddhism? The spirituality aspect of the Buddhism is one on the foundation of dana and sila on that foundation, which is important. You cannot just jump to secondary school or university, but on the foundation of dana and sila, that is for all of us. Then the spiritual aspect is that quest, that quest in your mind to search for reality, that quest in your mind to search and understand the Four Noble Truths, the quest to understand the three universal characteristics. That quest is not by following rites and rituals. No matter how many times you bow, you're not gonna understand the Four Noble Truths. You, no matter how many times you offer fruits and candles, you're not gonna understand the three universal characteristics. That is something you have to actually see within and without. That is the spiritual quest of searching. The Buddha has already given you the guidelines he has already taught you the basic instructions on how to drive a car. Now you have to learn by yourself how to drive a car. You cannot learn to swim on dry ground. You have to learn to swim in a swimming pool. So now we are looking and seeing, this is the theoretical understanding of the Four Noble Truths. All right, remember there are three aspects. Each of the four truths have three aspects. This is the theoretical understanding. This is what I'm doing. 
to understand the Four Noble Truths. And the third, I have done it and I've understood each aspect of the Four Noble Truths. So three done four, there are 12 aspects of it. But it begins with first putting it very simplistically, a theoretical understanding that Dima Piao, brother, you have two arms and two legs. And Dima Piao looks and search very hard. Do I have two arms? Do I have two legs? And he found, yeah, I have two arms and two legs. And the third stage, Dima Piao has through direct experience, know that I have two arms and two legs. Your spiritual quest in understanding that you have two arms and two legs is complete. So for us as students of the Buddha Dharma, we have to go through the same process in the teachings of the Buddha. And the teachings of the Buddha, while it numbers 9,559 suttas, you do not need to read off 9,559 suttas. You'll probably be very confused if you try. You need to know the Eightfold Path, the Four Noble Truths, and the Three Universal Characteristics. As, as I put in an earlier sharing, 84,000 Dharma doors, 84000. But this has one central core, and that core is you walk the Eightfold Path, you try your best to understand the Four Noble Truths and the Three Universal Characteristics. Okay, brother? Okay. Thank you. Second question from Diva Piao. Professor, as one practices constant meditative awareness, he's doing exactly what Bodhidharma taught. By not following pleasurables, he blocks greed. By not rejecting ple unpleasantness, he blocks hatred. And by not ignoring or blocking, but instead accepting and acknowledging all phenomena, he clears away delusion. Hence, the Zen tradition's emphasis on meditation, concentration, practice. Is this the right conclusion to the essence of Zen? And is this the right way for a disciple to follow? It's very hard to answer the essence of Chan in one statement or in five minutes. Sometimes when we say Zen, we start thinking of something very mythical. But Zen merely, merely means Chan, which merely means Jhana, which merely means a training of the mind. And when we say meditation, uh, that's also actually a word with a lot of baggage because when we say meditation, we immediately start thinking of somebody sitting on a cushion. Well, actually what the Buddha wanted was bhavana. So you have metta bhavana, you have samati bhavana, samatha bhavana, you have vipassana bhavana, etc. They are actually training of the mind. And one of the important aspects of training of the mind is to try and always look constantly into our own minds, that is minding the mind. I will be sharing on this in the next sharing. So brother Dim Piao, please attend the next sharing. The next sharing, sharing number 10 and sharing number 11, I have swapped because I wanted to start with 11 and then go back to 10. In sharing number 11, I will talk a little bit more about this, but meditative awareness is right mindfulness in every moment. In Chan, it is Guan Zi Zai. Guan, contemplation, observing, Zi Zi Zi, Xian Zai. Now, what are you doing now in your mind? Look, 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 always keep looking. And the Venerable Bodhidharma taught a lot of things, but one of the important things is that you mustn't be drawn to either extremes, all right? Now, for example, as I will be sharing in the next session, next Friday, um, I will not go into it too much, but I think that my sharing next Friday will basically answer most of the questions that I see listed here by brother. So I, can I beg your permission? Can we wait until next Friday? Then this will be explained in that one hour sharing. Thank you. And our three questions. First from Leong Yu Ming. How can one think like the Buddha and ask a good and relevant question instead of an ignorant question? Think like a Buddha is not asking a question. The question had already been asked and we are saying, how would the Buddha reply? Um, that means to say, I have an issue. I have a problem. This is how I would do. I'll probably go strangle the fellow, kill the fellow, etc., etc., which is a very 
common human reaction when we face an emotional, an emotionally upsetting event. But if you are an arahant, if you are a Buddha, or even lower down, if you are just simply a very calm, mindful person, how will you react? And so I think that that is what Brother Leong, we are trying to do. And often we say, take 10 deep breaths before you react. Brother Billy will say, long, slow, deep breaths for at least a period. And then only you respond. Don't react because reaction very much is driven by emotions. We want to respond in a calm, still manner, rationally, logically. So as I said, if you have a problem, and all of us have, the only people I know with no problems are dead. If you have a problem, we tend to address that problem emotionally. We react to the problem. Now, take LSD, long, slow, deep breaths. 10 breaths at the very least. And then after you calm yourself, ask yourself, if I am a wise person, if I am an Arahan, or even better, if I'm a Buddha, how will I respond? And then you respond, don't react. All right? Okay, part two of our Brother Leong's uh, question. Is it not rude, arrogant, or conceited to ask, to question, or challenge a view or concept? Is it not rude to challenge a view or concept of what, what person? Is it not rude, arrogant, or conceited to question, or challenge a view or a concept? We are always challenging views. We are always challenging concepts. We ask, is it true? For example, in the Kalama Sutta, we are in the Kalama Sutta, we are taught to ask, is it good? Is it wise? Is it praised? Would it lead to a good outcome? So we are always doing that. The Buddha tells you, Anicca. Now you ask, is it really Anicca? The Buddha tells you, Anatta. Now you ask, is it really Anatta? It is not rude. It is something that is in the training for you to actually ask yourself and see with your own eyes in your own experience, whether the first noble truth is correct. As I said, all the noble truths have three aspects. In the first aspect, you talk about the truth of Dukkha. So you have to ask yourself, is it really Dukkha? Look at your own life within and without, is it Dukkha? And look at your own life and see, yes, it is Dukkha. And the third aspect, you have verified that birth, aging, sickness, death, separation, association with those you don't like, the five pancha upadana kanda is dukkha. And then you say, yes, I have verified the first noble truth and it is true. So here you're actually asking yourself, testing out whether the, even the first four noble truths, the first, second, third, fourth, all four of them are correct. Now the Buddha is not going to get offended when you say, I am challenging the validity of the first noble truth second, third, fourth. In fact, that is what we are told to do. That's why all the four truths have three aspects. The first aspect, as I said, is the statement of a fact. It's just a statement. The second aspect is you got to test out that hypothesis. And the third one is, yes, I have finished. I've done my experiment. I've tested. It is correct. It is now no longer a hypothesis. I accept it as reality. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wong. The last question from uh, Duka Kors. Doctor, we try to use our wisdom to do something after thinking a few times if it is blameless, praised by the wise. However, sometimes we are in the wrong environment, time, community, example, advise a social community not to kill snakes. However, there are a few who voice their personal opinion of potential harm to their family. Do you think we should still continue to voice our well, there will always be people who will agree or disagree with you. You can only do what is within your ability. You can't save the whole world. You can only save what I call the starfish principle. If you walk on a beach where there are a lot of starfishes, it is impossible for you, sister, to save all the starfish on the beaches. But you can take one starfish and throw it back into the sea and say, okay, I have saved that one. So yes, we didn't even our own Malaysian family, for example, there will obviously be dissenting views, but you are perfectly right to voice out what you know 
is the right thing to do. You yourself, of course, should do what is the right thing to do. Whether others want to follow is beyond you. Even your own children, sister, you can't force them to do what they will not agree on. You can advise, you can voice out, but ultimately, okay, la, forget your own children. La. Even your own husband also you can't control. Forget about your own children. So while you can voice out and you yourself do what is the correct thing, the rest is up to the other people. Okay? Please remember, you can't save the whole world. Huh? Even the Buddha cannot save the whole world. There are only few with little dust in their eyes, I'm afraid. That's the last question from the, to, for tonight. So thank you, Dr. Wong, for the sharing. And uh, everyone look forward to meeting you next week, next Friday. Next Friday will be hosted by Subang Jaya Buddhist Association, right? No, 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 no. Next Friday is hosted by uh, AB. Kinara, is it? Not Subang Jaya. Next week uh, is yeah. Okay. So uh, with this, we will end by sharing our merit. Sorry. Let me share screen here. So let us uh, share the merits together. Let's do sharing of merits with all beings. Eta vata cha am hehi. Sambatang punya sampadang, sabbe sata anumodantu, sabbe sampati siddhiya. Let us also recall to mind our loved ones who have passed away, and uh, let's share his merits gathered from this talk with them. Idam me niati nang ho tu, sukita hon tu niata yo. Idam me niati nang ho tu, sukita hon tu niata yo. Idam me niati nang ho tu. Sukita hon tu niata yo. Let us also make some aspirations from uh, the merits that we have gathered from this talk. May we never follow the way of the foolish. May we be blessed with wise friends and skillful teachers who help us along the path of Dharma. Wherever we may be until our final liberation, may we never stray from the path of Dharma. May we always have the chance to practice Dharma and one day realize the highest place of Nibbana. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Wong, and uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you everybody for uh, supporting the background and uh, looking forward to see all of you next Friday. Thank you, good night.